Do you know what is actually going on when you press play on a YouTube video? Yep, yeah, that's a lot of stuff, and it all happens in under one second. And learning about it will completely change your perspective on the simple things that you do every day. So say you are on your browser and you click play on a video from your favorite creator. The first thing YouTube does is putting together something called the get request. In the request, the YouTube website in your browser asks, hey YouTube servers, this guy wants to watch a video with this ID. And the ID is usually this last piece of the URL. Where can I go get this video? Also, here is some other info about me, like cookies, that confirm that, yeah, this is actually Enrico logged in wanting to watch this video. And just so you know, also here is some info about the browser this request is coming from. Now, this whole thing gets packaged up and it's ready to be sent to YouTube servers. So let's imagine that I'm making this request from my hometown of Lazise, Italy. There are dozens of Google data centers around the world, but the closest one would probably be this one right here in the Netherlands. So how does this bunch of text get from my laptop to a computer in Google's data center in the Netherlands to be processed? What the browser knows is that we are sending stuff to www.youtube.com, which is like the postal address of where we want to go. But what we actually need is the latitude and longitude, which in this case is the IP address associated to youtube.com, which looks like this. So first, the browser checks if it has that address stored locally because it has retrieved it in the past in something called the cache. And if it doesn't, it sends a request to what is called a DNS server, whose only job is to get a URL and give you back the corresponding IP address. So now the browser takes this HTTP request that we made earlier and sends it down several layers of stuff. The first layer we encounter is called the transport layer. Here the request is broken up into different packets and each one gets assigned a sequence number. Now here there is a bunch of other layers and complex stuff going on and the packets are transmitted and able to find a way to the Netherlands and Google servers through actual copper or fiber optic cables in the form of ones and zeros traveling really really fast. Once there, the packets are intercepted and they climb back all the layers in Google's computer. In this way, they are put back to form the original content of the HTTP GET request. And finally, YouTube servers now know that Enrico wants to watch this video with a specific ID. So now you might think, okay, we went through all of this stuff, now YouTube is gonna just send us back the video to play, right? Well, not really. To understand what YouTube replies back to you, we first have to ask ourselves, what is a YouTube video? Is it the video file that the creator of the video uploaded in the first place, stored in some hard drive somewhere at Google? Nope. When you upload a video, say in 4K, the first thing that happens is that YouTube creates multiple versions of that video at different resolutions and different bit rates, meaning it will have less information per second of video. So there will be a version in 1080p, a version in 720p, 480p. Another key piece is that the video is not stored as a whole from start to finish, but is divided into different segments. They are typically 2 to 10 seconds long. So from a single video upload, YouTube generates even hundreds of small pieces of video at different resolutions. And what we just discussed are all puzzle pieces for something called Dash, or Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over HTTP. A nice catchy name for a protocol to stream video. So let's come back to our HTTP GET request to YouTube. What YouTube server sends you back is a dash manifest file. Based on the ID of the video you requested, YouTube makes a nice list of all the version of a video it has in all the different levels of quality, their bitrate, their resolution, and most importantly, the URLs where you can find those specific pieces of video. Now, this manifest file goes down through all the layers we saw before in Google's computers, becomes ones and zeros over the wires, finds a way back to Italy, all the way back up the layers to your browser, and now the YouTube video player that loaded in your browser needs to make a decision. It has all the resolutions of this video and where to find them, so it has to decide which ones does it serve you. To decide that, the player looks at your screen resolution, at your internet speed and some other factors and decides, okay, let's start with a 1080p version. So then it makes another HTTP request to Google, this time directly to the URL of the segment of the video that was in that manifest file, down on the layers, back in the wires, back up the layers, and finally YouTube sends over the first segment of the video file that you need. So the first two to 10 seconds of the video. Down the layers, into the wires, you know the drill by now. So finally, after all this, the YouTube player is finally able to begin playing your video. And remember this whole thing, keeps happening all throughout the video because your YouTube player needs to get the next segments of the video to keep going. Now, this is cool and all, but 
wait a second, what your browser gets back is something like an mp4 file, a video file, just the ones that you have in your computer from your illegally downloaded movies. How does this file translate to pixels moving on your screen to display the video? What is a video? Everyone knows that a video is just a bunch of moving images. We know that from the 1800s. So a video file should be just a bunch of images one after the other stored in a video file, right? Well, it turns out that storing an image file for every frame of a video would make the file size gigantic. If we take a 4K video that's 10 minutes long stored with images, we would get a file that's, well, 10 minutes, 30 FPS, 80,000 frames. At 4K, it's 1.2 million pixels per frame, three channels per pixel, eight bits per channel, 24 bits. We get a file that is 417.13 gigabytes per 10 minutes of video. This is why basically all the videos that you deal with digitally are compressed with what is called codec. And this is what goes on inside the YouTube video player that transforms a video file like an MP4 to a grid of pixels that can actually be displayed on the screen. The most used and popular codec that YouTube uses is called H.264. So here's how it works. Don't worry, we are almost there. Instead of storing each frame completely, we store the first frame, and then we take the second frame and divide it into macro blocks of 16 by 16 pixels. Then we compare the first and second frame, and we store only the macro blocks that are different from one frame to the next. So when the YouTube player finally receives a video file, it's basically reconstructing a sequence of full frames of pixels from this combination of previous frame information and new frame information. And this is it! This is what happens every time you press play on a YouTube video. Well, this is not really it because you skipped over so many other things like CDNs and working differently on different devices and the H.264 codec is much more complex than this. But the thing is that today, all these tech products and apps that we use every day look so simple and sleek and modern. But to build this apparent simplicity, they need to be incredibly complex. If you like this video, consider subscribing to my channel. And here is another one that you might enjoy.